Oh yeah. We Amazing. Okay. Well, it is the top of the hour. So good morning. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Ariel Zhang with Humane Rescue Alliance and co-hosting with me today is Irene Chansawong with Maddie's Fund. And we are really excited. Um, we were just talking about how we were fighting over who was going to introduce our presenter today, but um, plot twist, Irene won. So <laughs> little, little spoiler alert for you. Thank you so much for coming today. And um, so we're going to kick it off today with the question of the day. And the question of the day is, we've seen that a lot of people who work in the animal welfare industry had past lives in the corporate world or doing something completely unrelated. What did you do in your pre-animal welfare life and what skills were able to transfer over? Pop it in the chat. I would love if someone unmuted. Ooh, Morgan shared governmental budget and capital planning. I feel like we would love to hear more about that, Morgan, if you would be so kind to unmute. Yes, yeah, so I'm here in San Angelo, Texas at the municipal shelter. And so it was actually, I got to stay with my same organization just to move from the budget division to the animal services division where I had volunteered for many years. But yes, I spent 12 years um, in government budget and capital planning, working closely with all departments, including animal services. Amazing. This is probably one of my favorite questions that we've ever asked because all of these amazing skills in the chat here. I agree. We have human resources, banking, financial knowledge, a music and band teacher. Yay. Let's lift that up to more arts. Um, and then uh, a newspaper reporter, Donna. I didn't know that. Um, these are really, really cool. And a lot of human services, which we know we need in the field now. Restaurant manager. I love that training customer service and having those skills are important, I'm sure. A private investigator. Yeah, does anybody else wanna share some of their past life, career, and the skills that you've transferred over? Worked in a public library, Linda. That is super cool. I've worked in a library before too. Very organized. I'm assuming you probably very you're very organized. Um, let's see, we have a farmers market manager. A lot of journalists too. I love that. I do too. This industry really is all about storytelling. Yes, strong communications and marketing skills. I agree. Exactly. All right. Well, it is such a pleasure to be able to know more about everyone on this call. And next up, we have a couple announcements. Allison beat me to the punch uh, on the chat there. We are not going to have a meeting um, next Monday because it is in honor of Juneteenth. And as well, um, we would love from someone if someone from CARE would unmute and talk about the Juneteenth promo for CARE Ready. Dr. Okay. Alina, are you on the call? Would you want to do that? I promotion? am. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila's having some computer issues. Um, she was going to be the one to make the announcements, but I'm going to cover for her. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that for the month of June, uh, CARE is able to offer uh, Ready for free, thanks to Maddie's Fund. Um, and certainly it's uh, usually an $800 course, but it's free for the month of June. And um, if you, uh, if you're, you can earn a ready bronze badge and certification, and that'll get you access to our change makers circle as a disruptor. And that includes special events and access to resources to help put what you learn through ready into action. So thank you again to Maddie's Fund for making the scholarships possible. Amazing. Thank you, Maddie's, and thank you, Care. What a really cool opportunity. And with that, we will continue with national updates. Hi, I'd love to jump in. This is Jessica from Pet Finder. Um, I'm uh, weighing in just to mention that we have a webinar coming up on June 22nd. I can grab the link and put it in the chat. 
Um, it's looking at pet seeking trends that we've seen on Pet Finder through the first half of this year. Um, there are a few really interesting things that we, we've started to realize and notice and track on site. Um, but also we um, definitely see the pain that you all are going through right now. Um, we hit a record high of pets posted for adoption on site over the weekend. Um, there were 332,000 pets available for adoption on PetFinder uh, this past Saturday, and that is a really very high number. So um, you all are saying you're full, and we see that definitely. So we love you, and we're thinking of all of you. Emily, you want to go next? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Emily from the Correct Shelter Medicine Program at UC Davis. Um, we're working on talking points to strengthen shelters communication, encouraging finders to temporarily hold found dogs in an attempt to like locate the owner before bringing them into shelters. Um, we're seeking data surrounding dog bite incidents that have occurred while a finder is holding, holding or fostering a found dog. So if you have a Wait 48 or a similar finder foster program, we're hoping that you could fill out a quick survey for us. Um, I'll post a link to the survey in the chat. Thank you so much for your help. Any other national updates? Okay, Irene, over to you. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, and thank you for being so gracious to allow me to introduce Charlotte. It is my absolute honor to work with her. She is the community strategist at Maddie's Fund, has been part of the Community Conversations Steering Committee this past year. If you've needed help on the Maddie's Pet Forum, most likely she has reached out to you. Uh, so here to talk about community first, we are all about to learn about the dynamo that is Charlotte. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Irene, and thanks, Ariel, as well. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing. All right, you see some kitties there? Good, all right, awesome. Well, thank you, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm very grateful to be speaking. Uh, like Irene said, my name is Charlotte Otero. I'm currently the community strategist at Maddie's Fund. Uh, so I initially gave this presentation when I was asked to be the keynote speaker at my alma mater's first Women in Business Summit back in March. Um, and so when Mary suggested that I redo this talk on a weekly community conversations call, I hesitated because I thought, what would I be able to teach or share with this audience? You know, how do I make this applicable for animal welfare? But thanks to the support of the people in my inner circle and my colleagues, I was reminded of the importance of no matter what the work is, people are always at the center of it. You know, we often talk about thinking about pets in our care as individuals and not relying on breed labels to tell us about the behaviors of a dog. And humans really are the same way. So today I'll share my personal journey and my experiences in community management because I believe that lived experiences are so important, right? We all have a story and the journey that has led us to where we are today. And sometimes we need reminders of how far we've come or the events that have happened throughout our lives that have made us who we are today. And of course, to make my presentation apply to this audience, I've included lots of pictures and videos of cats and dogs. So if nothing else, you can at least be entertained by the passion that we all share here, which is pets. So this is a group of foster kittens I had last year that are just using my leg as a cat tree. So as I said, um, I'm the community strategist at Maddie's Fund. I've been with Maddie's Fund for almost six years now. So I'm on the two-person team that manages Maddie's Pet Forum, which is our online community dedicated to increasing collaboration and innovation among animal well-being professionals like yourselves. I am the youngest of three. My father was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and my mother was born and raised in the Philippines. My parents met while my dad was on deployment in the U.S. Navy, and I'm the first U.S. born member of my family. I'm also the first in my family to attend and graduate from college. So growing up as a military kid, it means we moved around a little bit. So I was originally born in Oakland, California. Then when I was about three years old, my dad got stationed in San Diego. So that's where I was raised. I grew up in an area of San Diego called Mira Mesa, where there is a very large Filipino community because my dad felt that it was important 
for my mom to feel comfortable and supported while he would be away on deployment all the time. I attended the University of Idaho on a full ride basketball scholarship and graduated from the College of Business there with a major in marketing and I minored in advertising. Now my college was in a very small town called Moscow, Idaho. Um, you may have heard about them in the news recently of not so happy news, but moving there from San Diego was definitely a culture shock for me. I remember landing uh, at the one terminal airport there on a prop plane that only had 13 rows. And I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to college here. There's no way. But I took the visit to appease my dad and my high school coach. So on my visit, I met my potential teammates, but it was really the dean of the College of Business at the time who made me feel really comfortable. His name was Mario Reyes. Uh, he's Filipino. And being able to see someone who was similar to me in a city where there weren't many other Filipinos, I immediately felt like this sense of community and support. His accent even reminded me of my mom. So I signed the scholarship papers, went and went through some of the most exciting and challenging times of my life. I was balancing being a division one college athlete, experiencing a whole new way of life in Idaho. And for the first time in my life, I was sitting in a classroom full of students where I was the only non-white person in it, you know, but being in that small town, it was really a tight knit community that made those years kind of fly by, it's especially being a student athlete um, and seeing other people of color in the athletics program out here, just trying to get our education and fulfilling our dreams of playing at the collegiate level. So after graduating college, um, I decided to stay in Moscow with my partner because we really fell in love with that community and the freedom we had. We loved being the big fish in a small pond, so to speak, but after a few years, I needed a new pond. So much to my partner's dismay, we moved back to San Diego, moved in with my parents, um, and I started taking online courses at the University of San Francisco, where I received an advanced online marketing professional certificate. Um, the small town life of Moscow, Idaho really made an impact on us because now we are new homeowners in a small town called Prineville in Central Oregon. So now I get to work remotely for Maddie's Fund, but now that I'm officially a homeowner, I finally get to foster kittens. Um, I foster for Bright, uh, Brightside Animal Center in Redmond. That top right picture in that corner is um, my foster fail keeper of a cat, Kanye. That was the picture of the first day we started fostering her. And then the picture below is now the big floof ball that she's become. Um, and then the bottom right is my first dog of my adult life, Cloakie, who I got in college and she's now 15 years old. So I initially was going to take these next slides out, but I kept them for a couple reasons. One is that it ties in with the question of the day, right? Most people who do what we do now in animal welfare never thought that we'd really be doing what we're doing now or being able to make a career out of it. So thanks to my prior life, I was able to attend college by taking advantage, to, by taking advantage of the opportunities in front of me through sports. So I competed in sports from the age of six to 22. Uh, my first sport was baseball. I was playing with all the boys. And then in second grade, I started playing basketball. Now, if you met me in person, you would probably never even consider that I played basketball, let alone got a full ride to play at the D division one level. I'm barely five foot two. So a lesson we've all heard, don't judge a book by its cover. But really, basketball was my first love. You know, it taught me a great deal about life about teamwork, dedication, and perseverance. Um, when I was in high school, in those four years, my team and I never lost a league game. We won CIF championships, Southern California championships, and we went on to play in state. And then I went to college and we lost a lot. <laughs> but those life lessons that each game taught me really has carried on with me throughout my professional career. You know, my claim to fame at UI was during my junior year, I averaged the most minutes played in the entire NCAA, men's or women's. So I averaged 40.6 minutes per game. So for those who don't know, a regulation basketball game is 40 minutes. So that means I played every second of every single game, including a couple overtime games. So my work ethic from basketball really transferred over to my professional career. And if you're not currently trying to recruit staff or volunteers who play or have played competitive sports, I definitely suggest you start considering 
the skill sets of those individuals and how that can apply to the work you need done in your organization. So like I said today, I really plan to tell you more about my journey, about how each of the communities I've been a part of has shaped my career and who I am as a person. But first I wanted to take a quick moment to go back to basics and consider what community means. You know, after all we do call these our weekly community conversations. So community can be um, a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common like the scientific community. Community can also be a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests and goals providing some sort of sense of community around you. And so I like to think um, that a single person can really belong to a wide variety of communities, right? It can be a mix of these four areas. So your family, one, is your first community that you are born into or you're raised in. You know, this is where you first create bonds with your ethnicity, your culture, and your values. Then there's your geographical community, like where you were born or places you live that make up your actual physical community. This is probably the one we mostly think about when we think about the word community. Um, and then there's the communities that you are part of based off of your ideals, like your principles, your beliefs, your lifestyles. Um, and lastly, you can belong to communities of interest. So these are things based on the things that you like, your hobbies, your passions, even brands that you like can open up a world of opportunities to really connect with like-minded people. Now, if I plug myself into this same chart, here are some of the communities that I belong to that make me who I am. Like I mentioned, I'm Filipino, Puerto Rican, American. The food I grew up eating, the way I was raised to follow the rules, keep my head down and work hard, were all instilled in me by my family. Geographically, I carry a piece of each of the places I've lived in my life with me. You know, I can be back here in the Pacific Northwest being friendly and polite, but when I go back to California to visit, I can quickly shift into being my aggressive California driver just to get where I need to go. Um, I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community, which is very important to me. Happy Pride Month. Um, and I still have very strong ties to the military, even though my father is retired. So my nephew is a Marine Reserve and my niece is an active duty Marine. So I wear my proud Marine aunt shirt with honor and respect for the sacrifices that our servicemen and women make for us. Even the way that I eat, you know, is part of who I am. And then below are just a few of my interests, but again, I feel very, very strong ties to these. I've always had a love for technology and design. I grew up in the 90s where there was no internet and and then suddenly a CD-ROM showed up at your door and boom, we're on the internet. Uh, my first online communities I participated in were AOL chat rooms, like downloading music from bots, or my dad would bring home burned versions of Photoshop. Don't tell Adobe, I don't think you can do that anymore anyways, but that's where I first started playing with graphic design, making MySpace backgrounds and like learning HTML. Um, and then music is something that, that really gives me life. In elementary and middle school, I played the flute. Uh, I was in chorus, and now I get my music fixed by going to live shows as much of it, as much as I can. And then, of course, there's animals. You know, I've had hamsters, rabbits, lizards, hermit crabs, fish, even scorpions in college, and then now we stick to cats and dogs, at least for now. Um, and each of these interests and passions have really shaped who I am as a person and my career path. So now I'm gonna pause just for a quick second. Um, and if you wouldn't mind dropping in the chat, some of the communities that you belong to or ones that are important to you. I would love to hear some of those things that make up who you are. Martial arts community, LGBTQ, I see it, music, animal welfare, vegan. All right, I love it, I love it. Thank, thank you all for sharing. I'm definitely gonna go read through all these later on. Um, but when I think about community now in like, in my world of online community management, uh, there are similar structures around community types. So we have communities of interest who are people who share the same interests or passion 
communities of place. So people who are brought together by geographic boundaries, communities of action, similar to what we are, people trying to bring about change. There's overlap with a community of practice, people in the same profession, undertaking the same activities or communities of circumstance. So people brought together by external event situations that could be, um, wild, you know, California wildfires, or it could be someone who's dealing with cancer or other health issues. But really the purpose of understanding the type of community that you are managing is to help the manager really provide the right calls to action, activation campaigns, to get your community members engaged and to feel supported. And so these same principles can be applied to different segments of your community that you may also be trying to engage with. So I got my uh, first start in online com community management working for a tech company called Black Backplane. Um, I really was able to manage all of these different community types throughout those years and really uh, throughout my work, even with Maddie's Fund, continuing to find these types of communities to engage with. So at Backplane, um, it was a community, it was a platform provider that created online communities for brands and celebrities. Our biggest investor was Lady Gaga. She was tired of the hate she was receiving on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. So she invested in Backplane to create her own site where she could communicate with her fans in a, in a safe space. So I landed the job in San, in San Diego, then I moved to the Bay Area, back to Oakland, uh, where I was born, but I never really got to experience, and I really got to finally live the like, epitome of startup life, right? As a small team and community, we played all the roles, just like many of you do within your organization. And with Tech Life, I again experienced the highs and lows, just like I did in my basketball career. So these are articles from TechCrunch about backplane throughout the years. With any startup, there can be really exciting highs where people are talking about your funding, your strategy, your growth. And just as quickly as you rose up, you can come crashing down. So these articles were three years after the previous ones. My personal favorite is the plane on fire crashing to the ground. So when the next community role presented itself, I, I jumped at the opportunity. It was with a consumer electronics company called Soul Republic. As I mentioned before, music is one of my favorite things in the world. I even have headphones tatted on me. So when I heard their mission statement, I really fell in love with all of it. Not only was I leading a community of music lovers like myself, I was in marketing meetings, coming up with the names of new products, going to high profile events like the NAACP Image Awards, Ultra Music Festival, hanging out with celebrities and musicians that I loved and I was giving out products. I was part of promotion video shoots, you know, giving guidelines to photographers and doing all the things in marketing that I had always dreamed of. But still something was missing. I was living in Oakland, the city I was born in, and I was commuting to San Francisco every day. This is a snap of what that commute was like for me often. People reaching over me, being in a sea of people all the time. And at my height, I was literally just like at armpit level. So it was not fun being on packed trains at the end of a long day. Plus staring at apartment buildings just wasn't leaving me feeling happy and fulfilled. So I took a step back and I really started to define what was important to me, both in my personal life and in my work life. I wanted to take the things that I learned from my previous jobs and things I felt were missing from my life and I wrote those down. I clearly defined what my non-negotiables were for my work and for myself. The number one thing on that list for me in work was I wanted a fully remote position. When I was with Backplane, I saw what it was like working with engineers and designers in Croatia. And I was just like, these guys have it made. I want that life. And a remote position I knew would give me the work-life balance I was looking for and the ability to move wherever I wanted. So my partner and I knew we wanted to move to Oregon because we knew we wouldn't be able to afford property in California. So new goal was get a remote job. I started looking at community management job boards with a filter of remote, and that's when I found Maddie's Fund. As soon as I landed that remote job, we moved to Bend, Oregon, a city we had never been to, a house we never saw in person and just hoped that it would work out. Lucky for us, it did. 
I started at Maddie's Fund in 2017 as an independent contractor. A couple years later, I was hired full time um, as a community strategist. Now, this was my first time working a fully remote position and my first time working in the nonprofit sector. And I felt like I was able to combine so many of my interests and previous work experience all into one. I was still designing our in-house platform, taking a lot of the features that were part of the community's backplane power and communicating that to our independent developers. Or when we switched platforms to what we're on now, I was excited to learn all the ins and outs of the new technology and how it could help us to better support folks like you doing this, doing this work day in and day out. So not only was I doing community design and tech focused work that I love doing, but I was building community for an organization that directly impacted dogs and cats, which I have always had a huge connection to. But moving into the nonprofit sector of animal welfare, I had a lot to learn about the industry. You know, every industry has tons of abbreviations for things, a language that only insiders understand. And I would browse the existing forums and be completely lost, needing to constantly Google things like, what's TNR? What's RTO? What's a surrender? You know, and it was just, constantly trying to make myself better so that I could understand this whole new world to me. I remember my first experience at HSUS Expo. I had only been with Maddie's Fund for like five months and I was working the booth telling people about the launch of Maddie's Pet Forum and I was terrified. Like I knew how to talk about the technology and how it could help you, but I had no idea how to talk about the real details of fostering or grant funding. I remember being mortified by something I said um, in a run through of our foster family feud game. And I thought, this is it. They're gonna know I'm a fake. But <laughs> of course, no one really remembers that moment. And now seven years later, I know lots of answers that I could have said, but it just took time for me to learn. This bottom right picture is from last year's best friends conference. Um, I was working the booth and this woman came up to the booth with a group of friends and her shirt said raised in the Mecca, Mira Mesa, California. And anyone who is from Mira Mesa knows that we call it the Mecca. So I was just in disbelief when I saw that on her shirt and I won't forget like moving people <laughs> aside so we could talk about where we grew up literally on the other side of the country, right? We were in North Carolina talking about a place in San Diego. So it was a reminder to me of the power of community and then the universe just giving me reminders of like, I'm exactly where I need to be. Now, like I've mentioned, I've worked in online community management for over 10 years. And there are things that Maddie's Fund is doing with Maddie's Pet Forum that I've never seen before in an effort to build community. And it's super exciting. One of those is awarding grants to active community members. The real power in community on the forum comes from each other from feeling supported and safe to share things that may be uncomfortable to talk about in our other communities. Euthanasia decisions may be really uncomfortable to talk about with your significant other or your parents, but you know, on Maddie's Pit Forum, you're talking to people who get it. Um, our goal with the forum is really to provide you with the resources and support to continue to do this important work. We run monthly resource drives to help build out our resource library with SOPs, tutorials, and examples of things that have worked well. Last month's resource drive was focused on fundraisers and there were dozens and dozens of ideas shared that I encourage you to check out. I know Allison or Irene will drop the link in the chat for me, but when I think about Maddie's Pet Forum and the power of bringing together this, to, this, bringing together this community of action and practice is that you get to expand your reach. You may be a one person or two person team who is doing all of the things. You've been staring at the same problem all week and you just can't figure out a solution. That's when I encourage you to really post that question or those thoughts going through your mind on Maddie's Pet Forum to see what type of community brainstorming we can do. You may come across someone who has had the same issue and found a solution that they wanna share with you. And by sharing that with the community, they help you and they also make themselves eligible to win a grant, like $3,000 grant for sharing your thoughts. Like, where other place can you really get to do that? And so throughout my life, my career, I felt and experienced the power of community, both online and in person. So these are some of the lessons that I've learned that I'd like to pass on. One is that everyone has something that they are passionate about. 
There are hundreds of thousands of online communities, subreddits, discords, Facebook groups, Twitter spaces, hashtags dedicated to something. You know, are you into fly fishing, veganism, crafting, electric bikes, gardening? There's a community of people who also love those things. You just have to go out there and find them. The way that this applies to animal well being organizations is to take a step back and find what those things are that people are passionate about where you live. You know, I grew up in San Diego, which of course has a large surfing community. Now in the small rural town I'm in, it's all about the rodeo and cowboys. So it's important to find ways to fit into those spaces in an authentic way. Second is that humans crave connection. You know, humans are not meant to be isolated. Being shut out from human contact can cause serious psychological damaging effects. That's why solitary confinement is used as a punishment in prison. And during the pandemic, social distancing guidelines forced us to change the way that we connect. Zoom stocks went crazy. This call came out of the pandemic. You know, online communities really hit a new level of engagement. TikTok's popularity grew by like 180% between 15 and 25 year olds. So there are just so many ways for us to connect. So finding where your community meets or hangs out will help you to authentically engage with them. As an individual, I also feel it's so important to find ways to connect with each other, whether that's your staff, your colleagues, your family, or your friends. We need that human connection in order to approach our work with compassion and to better navigate our lives away from our jobs. And in animal well being, we know that dogs also crave human connection. You know, cats, a little more questionable, they'll, they'll let you know if they want something. But overall, the, the human and animal bond is not to be underestimated. Next is that helping others gives us a sense of purpose and meaning. Action for Happiness is a nonprofit that's focused on creating a more happier and more compassionate society. On their website, they share, when we give to others, it activates the areas of the brain associated with pleasure, social connection, and trust. Altruistic behavior releases endorphins in the brain and boosts happiness for us as well as the people we help. And we know that compassion fatigue is huge in our industry. We're working endlessly to help the animals in our care and support the people as they come into our spaces. But helping others doesn't mean it has to be on a major scale. You know, it doesn't have to be a big mentoring project. It could be doing something as sharing your thoughts on a thread on the forum, or I've seen community members help others get concert tickets or seeing new community partnerships form that really just prove that if you help one person, one pet, or one family stay together, it keeps us going because each act gives us a sense of purpose and it increases our own feelings of self-worth. Next is that you don't ever have to feel alone. The internet is 24 seven, right? There are people on the other side of the world who you can speak to at the tap of a screen or a click of a mouse. Jose touched on this last week uh, during his community conversation. And he said that we spend a third of our lives at work. And as we're spending all our time at work or like many of us who bring our work home with us, it's easy to feel isolated and alone. There are days as a remote employee that I have tons of work to do while I'm watching five foster kittens who just won't stop pooping and painting the kennel with it on their tails. And I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. Many of you have been there, right? And you can't help but feel alone because that pet's health, their happiness, their outcome, it depends on you. So the power in community that I've found is that sometimes you just need someone who's like, I've been there or I get it. Or they have another horror story that's worse than poop on the walls and suddenly you feel a sense of relief, right? Finding your community of people who share your values or interests means you'll always have people to lean on when you're struggling or people to help you to celebrate your wins. Next is that representation matters. I always heard this and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, nice thought. But now as I'm getting older and I'm seeing more parts of myself being represented in mainstream media or on the internet, like I finally, I finally get it. I'm seeing more and more the power of inclusivity and the intersectionality of a person. 
and their communities. I'm seeing Filipino culture more on TV, music, and movies. I'm seeing more members of the LGBTQ plus community being represented in commercials or beautiful BIPOC faces and stories being told in all spaces. You may have seen recently when you visit one of our Maddie's Fun sites that we had a poll up that asked the question, how would you rate this statement? My organization's staff represents the demographic makeup of the communities we support. At the time I looked at the results, the majority of responses says neither agree nor disagree. So until this poll's majority answers are strongly agree, I believe that there is work to be done to make sure your staff and your marketing is representative of the communities you serve. Maybe that's looking at your hiring practices, your pay structure, or your fostering or adoption process. Do you know who on your staff is bilingual? Uh, during the 2021 Open Arms Challenge, Austin Humane Society made sure that they identified adoption team members who spoke Spanish and those adoption counselors received an increase in compensation for this additional skill, right? That is a skill. So if your staff is happy, they'll tell their community members, which can in turn increase your reach. And representation in the sense can of course mean your staff, but also how are you representing a person's different communities in your marketing? You know, when I was in eighth grade, I saw some March Madness games on TV. Well, yes, I was watching the greats like Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi play in college. I didn't necessarily see myself in them. And then I watched LSU play, who had a point guard named Tamika Johnson. She was 5'3", playing at the Division I level. And I saw her play, and I was like, if she can do it, then I can do it. And if it weren't for those games being televised and me watching her play, I wouldn't have thought a D1 scholarship was even possible for me. So when you're looking at your marketing, your staff, your services that you offer, make it a point to showcase a variety of people and pets because you'll never know what picture or post could lead to a new hire, a new donor, a new foster, or a new adopter. If you are looking for photos that reflect the diversity of your uh, community, I encourage you to explore petsandpeoplephotos.org. This is a new collaboration between HeartSpeak and Maddie's Fund and it provides you access to hundreds of inclusive photos that are free for you to use. In the first year of this project, over 500 pictures were taken all over the country to capture the bond between pets and their people. The library, of course, will continue to grow in the coming years, but like I said, the best part is that it's free and available for you to start using today. Now, focusing on community can really help you to lead more purposefully because you are being more genuine to who you are and the things that matter to you. So community involvement in the sense can be any activity that adds to the quality of life of a place or the people in it. If you think about community in a geographical context like the city or state you live in, you can lead by starting with things you can do within your physical community, being part of a community of action. Because there's something about physically seeing the positive impact you're making on a life that gives you a greater sense of accomplishment. Or if you think about community in a marketing context, a focus on community-centered content can help you reach your audience on a more personal level. When they see themselves and what you're putting out there, they feel an instant connection, like I did seeing Tamika Johnson play or reading Soul Republic's mission statement. And when we can connect with the people, we can make a greater impact on the quality of life for them and their pets. Focusing on community also helps you to build a deeper connection with your work because it connects your roots, whether that's your family roots, your hometown roots, or where you live now. When you're approaching your organization's programs with a community first mindset, you can see the impact on the people around you. When you're engaging with your community, mem your community members from a place of respect and dignity, you'll be able to lead your team and community in a more authentic way. And finally, when you feel that connection to your community and your work, you'll become a more authentic version of yourself because your community really makes up who you are, right? Sometimes that means finding sub-communities in the communities you already belong to or engage with to feel more authentic and understood. Like I mentioned, I work remotely and live in a rural town in Oregon where the demographics are 89% white. My family is mostly all in California. 
And as I get older, the people I keep in touch with or in my circle tends to shrink. Plus making new friends as an adult gets harder and harder because we spend so much of our time working. Then last year, I was invited to join a Zoom meeting of other BIPOC people who work in animal welfare. This group is thanks to Bobby Mann and Allison Cardona, who are two of the most incredible leaders and community organizers I've ever met. And I've worked with Lady Gaga, y'all, so you know, there's that. But it's because they lead from a place of compassion and authenticity. And getting to connect with someone uh, who has the same feelings or going through similar experiences as you, it makes you feel more grounded and understood, even in the midst of all the chaos that we kind of deal with in our daily lives. So as you reflect on what community means to you or the communities you hope to engage with more, it's important to check in with yourself often. Ask yourself, what values are important to me, both in my physical community and in my career? You know, a remote position wasn't important to me when I first graduated from college, but now I hope to never need to return into an office setting again. But that could change, who knows? What are your organization's values? Is one of them inclusivity? If so, how are you going to be more inclusive of specific community members? Ask yourself, how has your community shaped you to become the person you are today and the legacy that you wanna leave behind? Why do you live where you live? What about that community spoke to you and keeps you there? Think about what communities you belong to right now and why are those communities important to you? You may find that there is something that is missing and it's up to you to find the community and the people around you to help fill that void. And finally, I encourage you to find ways to create community however you can. People need community to help them thrive. You know, it takes a village. Find out, you know, how often do you participate in community events? Most everyone has come across that one person in their family or their friends that always needs a ride or they need money, but when you need something, they're not there. They don't answer your calls or your texts or they make an excuse, right? Don't be like that with your community. Don't only ask for donations from your community members, but when they come in looking to adopt a pet, you tell them they can't because they don't own their home or because they don't have a fenced in yard. Be an active part of your community outside of the shelter walls. Go to Little League baseball games on the weekend, soccer games. There are so many little kids there who would fall in love with a dog or a cat there and bug their parents for days until they adopt that pet. Get out in the community in events and spaces where you're integrated into what's going on. It's Pride Month. So if there's a Pride event in your city, grab a rainbow, adopt me or foster me bandana and take some long stay pets for a walk there. Show your support for your community on all days, not just when you're in a crisis or when the city is in crisis mode. Showing up for people matters and showing up for your community matters. Even if you don't think people see it or see you out there, they do. When I played basketball, it made a difference who was there in the stands to watch and support. You know, that could sway the whole game or it could affect the way that I played. And because of that, I always try to show up for those I care about because I would want that same thing for me. Show up for your community and they'll show up for you. Think about how are you making your community members feel? You know, we're all familiar with that Maya Angelou quote that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. When someone comes in to surrender their pet because their landlord says they will evict them if they don't, how are you making them feel? Are you scoffing because you've heard the same story five times today and you know you're at capacity? Or are you showing compassion and offering alternatives to intake? Emergency fostering, or better yet, finding out if their landlord even has the right to evict them. What did Diana Prado from Hard LA teach me? Did their landlord provide a written notice? You know, are you having a conversation with your community members so you can better offer services or counseling instead of judgment? Because chances are that once they get back on their feet or out of the situation they're in, they might not remember your surrender policy but they'll remember the shame that you made them feel when they're at a low point in their lives. Do your community members feel safe visiting your shelter or your organization? It wasn't until I moved out of California that I realized how important it is for me to feel safe as a queer BIPOC woman. 
I don't know if this business or organization is going to be accepting of me and my partner unless I see a rainbow flag on your window or on your website. Or better yet, seeing a queer couple or family in the imagery on your social media. That makes me feel way more seen. You know, to me, that's a way you can show allyship and build a connection with the community in an authentic and genuine way. If you want to connect with your Spanish speaking population, how are you making them feel when your entire website or adoption and foster paperwork are all in English? Seek out translation services who can help your community members feel more connected to you because you see them as a whole human being as they are. I've also got some links and resources uh, that will be shared in the chat as well with some places to start when you're thinking about translation services. Next is how are you connecting with your community both online and in person? We've learned from the internet that our donors and supporters don't need to physically live in our area to support our work. Plus the internet allows our communities to have access to plenty of educational materials that are often free to help people care for their pets. For example, in the Open Arms Challenge, Pinellas County Animal Services, they won the award for best overall effort. One of the things they did was they partnered with Good Pup which offers a week of free training and support to all shelter customers. So they are engaging their in-person community by having law enforcement recommend the service to citizens as they, as they assist them in the field by offering this free accessible training for everyone that's available online. Another example of engaging your community online is the Austin Pets Alive Positive Alternatives to Shelter Surrender Program, AKA the PASS program ran by Lucy Fernandez. Uh, their nearly 50,000 member Facebook group is just one way that they connect people needing help for their pets with other community members who are able to help. The program provides resources and services to Texas residents who are experiencing challenges, again, with the goal of keeping pets out of the sheltering system and providing a safe, judgment-free zone for anyone in need. By watching their community members engage online, they can provide emergency pet food, pet resource assistance, and referrals. Also include a shameless plug that Lucy uh, will be teaching an online instructor-led course this fall on Maddie's University about supported self-free homing. So you can learn more about implementing a, a similar program. And finally, how are you investing in your community? As a leader in an organization, are you investing in the professional development of your staff? How are you doing so? You know, are you making the efforts to retain talent and keep your staff invigorated with a feeling of community by sending them to conferences or other in-person events? I feel it is so important to make the resources available to do so because the human impact of that shows them that they are valued and given new opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have invest in your community by investing in your people. You know, if you're new to animal welfare and wanna learn more, how are you investing into your own work? Are you making the effort to find a mentor or peers that you can learn from? If you've been in animal welfare for, you know, for a while, think about what type of support you wish you would have had when you started and help someone else who is new. Give them the space to ask you questions or tips. You know, you've got to make the time to build relationships with people whether that's your staff, your colleague, or your physical community members. And at the end of the day, we're all humans and deserve to be treated with dignity, respect, and to feel supported by our community members at all times. Now, I'll leave you all with uh, some pics that mean a lot to me. The pictures on the left to the right corner and the bottom left are some of the incredible people from that BIPOC group I mentioned. Um, that I met from last year's care conference to this year's expo. Like, I, I can't iterate enough how much this community of people have helped me with my professional development, my mental health, and they all continue to fill my cup up every time we get to see and support each other. Then of course, there's my Maddie's Fun team who I'm so grateful to get to work and grow with all thanks to Maddie. Uh, the wiener dog there is foster cat daddy Carter. He uh, was my dog that I've had since he was about six months old. He was very patient with every single group of foster kittens I had um, until he passed last August. And then above him is my fiance Misha with maybe our second group of foster kittens. I don't know, we've lost count by now, but she's really the, the cat lady that really uh, got me into fostering. 
And then below that is another incredible human being, Jose Ocaño, who I met through the BIPOC group. If you haven't yet, be sure to watch his community conversation from last week on intentional leadership. I think I watched it three times already. Um, and so down at the bottom, there's my contact information. Please, please feel free to connect with me. The top link is the discussion thread for this call on the forum. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on community and more about the communities that are important to you. And finally, this quote by Margaret Wheatley really hit home for me that I wanted to share with you. It says, there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. So as you go through your life and your career, no matter how successful you may become or the struggles that come your way, never forget the communities that built you and continue to give back to them and the people in them however you can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And I know a lot of people on this call have so much respect for you. And I hope that folks go on the Maddie's platform to share their love. Uh, we appreciate everyone for being in community with us today. Have a wonderful week. Thank you to Ariel for being a great co-host. Um, and to everyone, happy Pride Month. Take care. <laughs>